Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us today for the webinar entitled Make the Swap, Why It's Time for Heat Pumps, Not ACs. My name is Camille Kadosh and I'm with the Regulatory Assistance Project and I have the pleasure of moderating this webinar today. Rising gas prices in the U.S. and groundbreaking U.S. climate legislation at the federal and some state levels are driving heat pumps into the spotlight. This means the time is ripe to accelerate the deployment of this super efficient technology across the country. Over 50 million U.S. homes have se separate central air conditioning units and fossil fuel heating systems. A promising way to boost home heating electrification is to replace those central air conditioners with look-alike two-way heat pump units that can provide highly efficient heating in addition to cooling at little upfront cost extra cost. This has the immediate benefit of, costing fo of cutting fossil fuel use by effectively creating hybrid household heating systems. It also helps to smooth the path to full home electrification by boosting demand for heat pumps, increasing installer capacity, and raising consumer comfort with new technology. But on a practical level, how will this work? How do consumers actually get heat pumps installed? And how do they work in homes? Today, we have collected a group of thoughtful experts to learn about these opportunities and to answer these questions and the ones you pose. To understand the policy landscape and the practical details, we're going to hear from policy expert, experts and perspectives from heat pump installation experts, as well as the manufacturing perspective. We will hear from Matt Melanowski from CLASP, Western Berg from ACEEE, Nick Harbeck from Johnson Controls, and Nate Adams from HVAC 2.0. Before we start, several quick process points for those of you who have joined us today. We'll be muting your microphones given the large number of you who have joined. You will be able to submit your questions through the Q&A function on your screen, and we will do our best to get through all of them. We'll run this webinar for 60 minutes and an additional 30 minutes for those of you who want to continue the conversation. This webinar will be recorded so people who are not able to attend can still enjoy today's discussion at a later date. It will be posted on the CLASP YouTube site and will circulate a link after the webinar. We will be sending you slides from today and a link to that recording in the next few days. With that, I am pleased to introduce Matt Milanowski. Matt has spent over a decade supporting the U.S. Department of Energy and EPA Energy Star Efficiency Programs, and is now CLASP's Director of Climate Research, leading energy modeling and finding new ways to reduce appliance impacts. Matt is going to introduce, introduce us to hybrid heat and provide some background. Matt? Thank you, Camille. Hi, good afternoon. Good morning, everyone. Uh, as Camille said, my name is Matt Malinowski, and I'm excited to share with you uh, a great, uh, low-cost, fast, and hopefully easy way to deploy heat pumps faster and at scale. Uh, but first, just a brief introduction to CLASP for those who may not be familiar with our work. Uh, we're a nonprofit organization that improves the energy and environmental performance of appliances and equipment around the world accelerating our transition to a more sustainable world. And what that means is we work on efficiency as a means to climate mitigation by reducing the energy use, costs, emissions due to appliances and equipment, as well as by providing clean energy access. With more efficient appliances, you can use smaller panels, lower costs to provide um, energy services to unelectrified people around the world including um, more energy service, such as refrigeration and other productive use appliances. Today, my goal is really to talk about a way to transition to clean, efficient heat, cost-effectively and at speed and scale. But before I get into the details of that, uh, we'll do a little quiz here. Uh, what are we looking at? This is a picture taken from a manufacturer website. It's a screenshot. And so uh, I want you to you know, y yell out into your muted microphone what you see, um, or, or feel free to put in the Q&A. Uh, but uh, hopefully, if we were live, I'd be hearing some maybe some air conditioners, maybe some heat pumps, maybe some condensers. 
um, you know, maybe that box that's sitting outside my house. Well, um, the manufacturer calls this an air conditioner. And this is the condenser or the outdoor unit uh, that you would find outside your house. Interestingly, on the very same web page, there's this picture. So this is the same part of the same screenshot. I can't tell the difference between the two. It's possible it's even the same image. But the manufacturer, and you can see their link there at the bottom of the screen, calls that a heat pump. And sure enough, uh, when the Department of Energy looked at this in 2016, they found about $131, so about $150 worth to, of today, of part cost differences between the two. Uh, there is not that much of difference between air conditioner, the outdoor unit, and a heat pump, um, mainly the reversing valve, defrost board, some control circuitry. So very similar on the inside, but that small additional price, um, less than $1,000 on the consumer side, can unlock huge opportunity. So here, as you can see, I'm going to just zoom out of this just so you can see I'm not making this up. And let's look at that third uh, picture on, on, this, on this screenshot, gas furnaces. So right now, when people talk about electrification, um, they talk about swapping out gas furnaces for heat pumps. And today in the US, uh, there are about 4 million heat pumps sold per year and 4 million gas furnaces. But if we take a step back and look at this opportunity of replacing air conditioners for heat pumps, we can get an additional 6 million electrification opportunities per year. So opening a whole new front in this, um, in this effort. And what would that look like over time? Well, if central air conditioners, as they fail, were replaced by heat pumps, um, here indicated in yellow as converted heat pumps, you could see that in 10 years, more than half our housing stock would have heat pumps, independent of any other efforts of swapping out furnaces and boilers. So it's a, it's a great opportunity at low cost. But how would it work in practice? So here's an image, uh, just a simple graphic of um, you know, a typical American home. I think something like 47% of uh, US homes look like this. They have a uh, furnace, um, a hot air furnace. So they have ducts uh, to blow that uh, hot air inside and they, for heating and for cooling, they use a central AC outdoor unit, which uses those same ducts. And what we're proposing to do is replace that AC unit with a heat pump. Again, do you notice the difference? Well, here it is. It's the same little cube as before, outdoor unit, but it has the heat pump superpower of being able to provide heating, um, not only cooling, but, but also heating, independent of what the furnace is doing. So you can see the furnace remains in place. It can provide the backup heat, it, it kind of provides some resiliency, but the heat pump is, is importantly um, displacing some of that fossil fuel heating. And our modeling of the contiguous United States, so 48 states plus DC, found that under very conservative assumptions of a switch over from heat pump to furnace at 40 degrees Fahrenheit, so very conservative, uh, we could eliminate 39% of fossil fuel heating. And that would result in an 11% decrease in households' utility bills and uh, coincidentally, CO2 emissions, uh, growing to about 50 megatons of CO2 annually uh, by 2032. So a big opportunity, uh, but you know, I just want to raise, put some caveats here. Uh, we think this is a, a great short-term solution. So over the next five years or so, um, you know, eventually, of course, we'll need to do full electrification. But we think that this has some real advantages. There are very few barriers to doing this kind of electrification. The heat pumps are usually drop-in replacements for air conditioners using existing technology. Uh, so you don't have to worry about um, cold climate performance necessarily. You can, but 
you know, our proposal works with standard heat pumps that are commonly available and inexpensive. Uh, there's maybe less of a concern about fuel switching because your furnaces uh, can stay in place, lower upfront costs, and importantly, big bill savings. So the average household saves $256 um, dollars per year, but households using oil, propane, or electric resistance, the high cost fuels, would be saving about four to five hundred dollars per year uh, using prices from last winter, perhaps even more this winter. And one other advantage is there's less of an impact on the electric grid. So one of the papers that uh, we used that, that was the basis for our modeling looked at this very question of how much more grid capacity would you need to electrify all of our, the US's heating loads. So here is how much of our current heat uses fossil fuel. The darker the color, the higher the percentage. The national average is 70%. If we just look at the grid today, how much capacity it provides, we could get that percentage down to 43%. As you could see, we could electrify pretty much the entire Southeast where you know there's already capacity due to cooling, high cooling loads, and not that much heating load. But we would have more trouble in the north. However, with this hybrid solution of keeping the furnaces for the coldest days, you could eliminate all but 2.3% of the fossil fuels. So, um, you know, again, there, there are some advantages to, to these, um, this hybrid solution. Uh, grid resiliency is one of them. Um, Cold temperature performance is another. You know, as, as you may know, uh, heat pumps, you know, have been used in climate zones one through four uh, for, for a long time now. This is where the majority of them can be found today. Um, climate zone five has been achievable with inverters for the past 10 years or so, and, and that's now reaching up to climate zone six, but uh, climate zone seven is harder. So this is a, you know, this kind of hybrid solution um, would be a, a good option in, in climate zone seven. And then lastly, uh, places where, where electricity costs are still high. You know, so here uh, we've plotted the ratio of electricity prices to gas prices per kilowatt hour delivered um, to, to residences in 2021. So how much more expensive is, is, people, is electricity? And you know, roughly where where the costs are, are three or, or fewer, so the bluer states, is, is basically where heat pumps um, make the most sense in terms of costs. Some of the higher cost uh, electricity states would really benefit from, from a hybrid solution because you could always fall back on that gas in, in the coldest days when the costs are highest. So where, uh, how do we get this done? Um, We've been working with Congress on incentives through the Heater and IC Hot Acts in the Senate. Um, we're looking at federal programs. Can Energy Star encourage this? Uh, could states do it uh, through state standards? Building codes. Uh, there's a proposed amendment to Denver's building ordinance that uh, would require AC, AC for heat pump replacements. Um, and there is a model code that includes that. And lastly, getting rid of AC requirements in utility programs. So no longer supporting efficient ACs when a much more efficient heat pump exists. So that's just a brief introduction to this opportunity. Um, you can find out much more in our new paper together with the Regulatory Assistance Project. Um, you can find it at the link here or um, take out your, your favorite QR reader and uh, you can download it directly to your phone and read more about the opportunity. Uh, specifically, you can look at the benefits by state and by fuel. So thank you so much for your attention uh, to this introduction and looking forward to the discussion. All right. Well, thank you, Matt, for that great background. Um, a quick note, I see a lot of excellent questions coming in both through the chat and the question and answer format. Um, if you could put the questions you have in the question and answer uh, chat bubble there, that would be great. And as you see, some of our panelists are responding to these questions on the fly, which is a great way to have a uh, really robust dialogue here this afternoon.
So with that, I'm going to start to introduce the rest of our panelists, and we're going to have a good discussion here. Weston Berg is our senior researcher from the state policy team at the American Council for an Energy Efficient Economy, where he provides research and technical assistance related to utility regulations and other state government policies to meet climate goals and efforts to build an equitable clean energy future. He's also helped lead ACEEE's state energy efficiency scorecard since 2016. Nate Adams is CEO of HVAC 2.0, a business model for HVAC contractors that naturally lean towards electrification. He's known as Nate the House Whisperer and has been electrifying homes since 2014. And Nick Harbeck is a manager of regulatory and environmental affairs at Johnson Controls and is engaged in the reduction of emissions across the business and promotion of smart, healthy, and sustainable buildings. Thank you, gentlemen, for joining us all today. So we have a few questions to start our discussion. And Weston, I wanted to start with you. Can you explain what are some of the most significant policy actions occurring in the states today that affect the adoption of heat pumps? Sorry, I'm muted. Uh, yeah, so uh, yeah, thanks for that question. Um, and I, I probably have a couple of slides here to help kind of walk through some of that, but um, we're probably seeing the most work being done in states that have uh, adopted major clean energy legislation in recent years, um, particularly those that really wanna make the most of the carbon benefits, uh, um, the investments they're making in, in uh, developing a clean electricity grid. Uh, California and Massachusetts get, me get mentioned a lot, um, but just in the past year and a half, we're seeing you know this type of work really build momentum in in places across the Midwest, uh, Minnesota's Eco Act, um, Illinois and its Climate and Equitable Jobs Act um, are a couple of good examples. A lot of a lot of energy legislation coming out of Colorado too have really spurred efforts to promote uh, heat pumps and and building a, a electrification, particularly through a lot of utility energy efficiency programs. Um, maybe I'll just go ahead and share my screen. Just a couple slides. Uh, hope, hopefully folks can all see that. Um, but uh, a significant barrier has been uh, a lot of these utility programs traditionally have been designed to haven't been designed to promote fuel switching um, from fossil fuel heating to electric. And in, in some places, uh, some of the utility regs actually act, active, uh, actively prohibit that type of fuel switching. But you know we're seeing states, um, as I mentioned, doing the work to reform those types of policies and promote uh, heat pumps and build awareness. Um, so there's really a, sort of a broad suite of po uh, best practice policies. First would be just um, you know target setting. Some states are setting explicit targets for heat pump adoption um, and providing customer incentives to promote them. Um, for example, Maine has a has a goal to adopt 100,000 heat pumps by 2025. Uh, New York has also established a heat pump savings sub-target that's sort of incorporated incorporated into its broader efficiency goals. Um, and uh, this the slide I have here kind of talks through um, the half of states that have a state energy efficiency resource standard for the utility sector. So they're actually you know mandating multi-year savings targets uh, for utilities. Um, and, and some of these is the, the ones highlighted uh, here um, in sort of the call out boxes are the ones that are updating those standards to focus on things like total fuel savings, total system benefits, uh, total uh, greenhouse gas emissions avoided, uh, which can kind of be transformative in shifting the focus away from just sort of a siloed uh, focus on saving kilowatt hours to uh, the total societal benefits of total uh, a heat pump adoption. the other slide here. Um, and then second would be to update utility rules uh, to clarify that efficiency, energy efficiency programs can fund electrification as a form of energy efficiency, uh, particularly when it saves total energy and greenhouse gas emissions. Since this isn't, as you can see here, this isn't the case for most states' utility regs. Uh, and this really helps provide some certainty and enables utilities to go after those savings in a deliberate way as Massachusetts has. Um, there's quite a few the states here in orange uh, are states that really um, either discourage or um, indirectly prohibit 
uh, use of energy efficiency funds for fuel switching. Uh, some of the states in green here um, are the ones that have updated their guidelines uh, to uh, go after, to, to allow uh, energy efficiency funds to be used towards heat pumps. Um, and then third, I just say an important, another important piece here is just valuing the total energy and climate benefits of electrification in program planning and evaluation. Um, cost effectiveness tests are really uh, an important key determinant in for how much utilities invest in these programs and uh, you know not valuing, valuing the full range of benefits can impede heat pump adoption. Um, Colorado, for example, just recently um, now requires cost benefit analysis um, for heat pumps to include incorporate the social cost of carbon. Um, so I guess I just stop there. There's a, a range of other um, things that states can do. Some states are adopting performance incentive mechanisms for utilities to explicitly go after uh, reward heat pumps, uh, heat pump adoption, and other climate forward measures like deep retrofits or uh, specific measures that um, are based off of uh, meeting greenhouse gas emissions reduction goals, um, uh, updates to statewide building energy codes um, that uh, incorporate electric ready requirements. So a whole range of things, but um, uh, but yeah, I'm sure we'll get into some of those in some of other uh, the, the discussions. So, um, but yeah, I guess I'll just pause there for, for any questions. All right, thanks Weston for that background. So it sounds like based on what some existing state policies are, encouraging heat pump adoption now, and some of these things that you've uh, noted for future policy evolution that could also foster more heat pump adoption. Nate, it sounds like your services as an installer could really increase here in the future. So I'm wondering, can you explain what does it look like when you swap out an air conditioner for a heat pump? And are we ready for this amount of growth? Um, the, the answer is it's not a big difference and largely yes. So um, it the, the difference between an air conditioner and a heat pump primarily is that it's on legs so that it can stay uh, elevated a little bit because when it's in heat pump mode, like when it's in air conditioner mode, it's making water inside the house and then draining. Um, you know, it's part of, you know, an air conditioner is also doing dehumidification. So when it's in heat pump mode, it makes water outside. So you raise them up both so the water can drain out underneath and so you keep them above snow level. So they're on snow legs. So I, I joke with my clients, this is the droid that you're looking for because um, it ends up looking like a little droid standing on legs. Uh, and fundamentally, it doesn't take very much longer to install, um, 20, 30 minutes, something like that. Uh, one of the big changes might be if you have an older installation, there might only be two wires going to the thermostat and you need a minimum of four to run a heat pump. So two for heating, two for cooling. Um, so you may need to pull a new thermostat wire. That is, however, best practice for an install. So it's not a big difference. And fundamentally, it's the same piece of equipment. All the connections are the same. I mean, there's there's very, very little difference. Uh, the, the primary issues will probably come in what's called commissioning, which is the setup. Um, exactly where you set your changeover, where it switches from the heat pump to the furnace um, or whatever the other backup fuel might be. Um, that's where there's going to be some bumps in the road, I would expect. But I, I mean, fundamentally, the way that I compare a heat pump and an air conditioner, it's, it's like two identical cars, but one has a reverse gear and the other doesn't. Otherwise, they're the same. So boots on the grounds, if you're just talking basic systems, going from a basic 14, soon to be 15 sear uh, air conditioner to a 15 sear heat pump, the installs are nearly identical. So that's reassuring to hear. Um, I guess my quick follow-up question here, Nate, is how do you find a local contractor who's knowledgeable about switching out from AC to heat pump? Is that an issue? Well, that can be for full electrification. That's very challenging, um, to be frank, um, because most contractors are going to be against this. That's one of the reasons that the whole hybrid idea came up in the first place. This lets everyone keep their safety blanket, 
So the utilities keep the safety blanket. Uh, uh, we, we aren't going to stress the grid nearly as hard with this path. You can put a hybrid in any home. So if a home has air conditioning, you can make it a heat pump. Um, so it, it, when you're stacking them, it's, it's just not a complicated thing. And you can put this in a home that has not yet been upgraded. Uh, like there was a, a recent study in Toronto where one of the homes that they put just a basic single stage 14 sear heat pump, I mean, basic, um, into a larger, it was like a 3,000 square foot home uh, that was older, poorly insulated, very leaky. And that reduced that home's uh, gas usage that winter by over 50%. So you can do this in any home with little pushback from contractors. Uh, but the, the critical thing that needs to happen is because the vast majority of installs are done on an emergency basis when the air conditioner fails on a uh, hot day or the furnace fails on a cold day, what is in the, uh, the supply house needs to be a heat pump or another air conditioner is getting installed. It's just like, because you, you put in what's on the shelf. You don't Got have it. time. So bottom line, switching out the AC for the heat pump is not it's not a big lift, and it's better to schedule it ahead of time versus doing the emergency install. Correct. Okay. Well, thank you for that. And Nick, I wanted to talk with you, given the fact that currently there's more air conditioners that are sold every year than furnaces. Are manufacturers targeting the air conditioner market for heat pump replacements? Yeah, thank you, Camille. It's a great question. And, and the short answer is yes. Um, we, we view this as a, an incredible market opportunity, both from the market perspective, but also from an emissions reduction perspective. As, as Nate alluded to, this new sort of hybrid model is a great way to target a new market and also provide um, emissions reductions in a way that hasn't been addressed before. As Matt pointed out in his presentation, historically, we've kind of seen heat pumps replace the furnace market because um, they're viewed as this heating market. But heat pumps replacing ACs are an incredible way to take exactly what they mentioned, the existing infrastructure, and upgrade it so that you now have this AC that runs two ways, known as a heat pump. Um, to provide a little bit of context, um, this is already taking place to some extent. Um, we've seen heat pumps grow at a pretty quick clip. Um, around the past couple of decades, we've seen heat pump installations and the number of units sold double about every nine years, whereas AC installation and unit sales have maintained a consistent three to 7% growth year over year. So heat pumps are continuing to take up more and more of the market space. And we see more opportunities to continue to displace that um, AC market with more and more heat pump installations. So yes, in short. All right, thank you. So we talked a little bit um, earlier about there is a slight price difference between doing an air conditioner and a heat pump. Can you guys speak to that? Um, I can tackle that one. So it, in general, when I've looked at prices, the wholesale cost difference. So we're talking what the contractor pays on the shelf at the supply house uh, generally runs somewhere between three and six hundred dollars different if you're looking at the same unit. So that that doesn't mean you're you're going from a low end to a high end. That's the, the same uh, you know, 15 seer piece of equipment, 18 seer piece of equipment, whatever it might be, the price difference is approximately three to $600. Um, if you're looking at different uh, scales of equipment, there's thousands of dollars of difference between them, but that would be true for both the air conditioner and the heat pump models. I could also maybe address some incentives as well here. I saw a question come through and I think this segues directly into this question, um, but there are a lot of programs out there to incentivize the installation of heat pumps. So in addition to the low cost from switching to an AC and heat pump in the first place, like Nate had mentioned, um, there are very robust incentive programs. And a great example is the Inflation Reduction Act, where the requirement for some of these programs, I'll allude to 25C, which is the federal tax credit, and uh, the High Efficiency Electric Homes Rebate or Homes Program, um, are keyed off the installation of a heat pump writ large. So as long as you install a heat pump, even if you have a furnace installed already and you're using this as a new hybrid system, you benefit from those incentives. Those incentives are very, very rich and oftentimes directly move the needle on what is the more advantageous type of equipment to install, and it's in the direction of heat pumps. All right, thank you both for that. So another question is, what does hybrid heat do for consumer choice? 
uh, this is a, a critical thing too. So uh, we may view making it uh, in theory, if only heat pumps were available versus air conditioners, that could be viewed as less consumer choice. But the better way to look at it is it's substantially more consumer choice because now there are two heating fuels to choose from. So you aren't stuck with whatever your propane price is, your gas price, your oil price. Uh, you also have your electric uh, utility that you can use. And also, thanks to solar and batteries, you could reduce your overall costs if you happen to live in a high electric cost area by installing solar or buying um, a community solar. So it increases consumer choice substantially. All right. Another question that I commonly hear when we talk about heat pumps um, and electrification is, do we need to take care to do weatherization and energy efficiency upgrades before you install a heat pump, particularly from an emissions point of view? I guess I'll take this one. Um, so uh, we have done a lot of shell work um, and figured out a process for repeatedly diagnosing and then project managing those installs. But realistically, what we're seeing is at HVAC replacement, which would be the ideal time to do weatherization because you can plan it all together and decide what size you're going to use and choose your system very carefully. Realistically, unless there is some effect on resale value, it's just a very expensive thing that very few people are going to do. What we're seeing is somewhere between maybe, like this is at best, one and 3% of HVAC replacements are going to involve substantial shell measures that would make a, a noticeable difference, say a half ton or a ton uh, or more difference in the load of the house. So realistically, I don't think we can lean heavily on weatherization until we have other policy or market pieces in place. Uh, which makes the hybrids also very attractive uh, because you can do it to any home as it stands. And it, if you choose a nice variable speed, relatively small, say two or three ton heat pump, that will probably still be the right piece of equipment even after weatherization. Because that's one of the key things we do in our program is we want to understand where the load of the house is now, where it could be, uh, with reasonable shell upgrades, and is that the same piece of equipment or not? And if it's a different piece of equipment, we really need to have another conversation about, do we want to consider shell upgrades and size the equipment to where the house is going, or do we want to size the house to where it is now? So that will be a challenge, but you can do hybrids without weatherization. Yeah. I will say that there is like a, a lot of great examples of states that are are looking at ways to kind of pair incentives, um, you know, weatherization incentives with heat pumps, um, and it, it's something to look at overall, like system wide. States that have you know, uh, looking at winter peaks and um, just trying to control overall uh, grid demand. They're uh, you know looking at ways to to sort of harmonize things and coordinate a lot of the weatherization, their weatherization programs with heat pumps. Mass Save is a good example of, um, uh, you know, their new targets for energy efficiency programs that are built now around greenhouse gas emissions, um, uh, which has meant that they're really going after um, uh, home retrofits and, and, and heat pumps a whole lot more. And they're specifically looking at ways to target outreach to custom, uh, homes that have already been weatherized. Um, Offering enhanced incentives for customers who you know weatherize their home prior to installation, offering other ways to bundle incentives. So um, it's something that definitely utilities are are uh, are doing. The ones that are you know uh, deliberately looking at this. All right, thank you both. So following up on the emissions question, what about refrigerant emissions? Are there enough policies in place to encourage the use of low GPW uh, P refrigerants? Sure, I can I can take that one, Camille. Um, yeah, so so I think the refrigerant question comes up when, when talking about heat pumps. And my, my perspective is okay, 47% of homes in the US have central AC, right? So replacing those central ACs with central heat pumps does not change your refrigerant impacts from what already exists, right? Um, so that I think is is kind of a little bit of a of a red herring. Uh, in terms of electrifying 
the remainder of the homes that don't have heat pumps yet. Um, you know, currently the most common refrigerant for ACs is R410A. Uh, and correct me if I'm wrong here, Nate, but that, that's my, my understanding, which has a GWP of, of around 2000, so 2000 more potent than carbon dioxide. Um, through the um, AIM Act, and you know, which is harmonized with the Kigali Protocol, uh, we're now getting refrigerants like R32, which has uh, a GWP of around 700. Uh, so you know, uh, basically one third the impact. So there, there is progress being made. Um, you know, I think the total impact, it's not going to be cat. You know, I mean, it's already high, but it's not going to be you know, catastrophically worse than, than it is now. And, you know, there, there are real benefits from reduced uh, CO2 emissions and methane leakage um, due to electrification. All right, thank you. Um, we'd previously talked a little bit about incentives. Um, and I guess the question is, are contractors aware that hybrid heat uh, qualifies for uh, under the Inflation Reduction Act. Um, it seems that being aware could be a big potential push for a, a change that kind of everybody's comfortable with, right, to do hybrid heat. Um, but are they aware that it qualifies for these incentives? So I'm curious Nick's thoughts on this as well, but as it stands now, not really. Um, but at least uh, as as the IRA bill is written, it's definitely not prohibited because some of the earlier versions look like it it was prohibited. It was going to be electric only. Um, and actually, I, I think the, the the paper that Matt and I uh, and Steve Pantano worked on helped with that piece. Uh, but yes, there will be an educational program that needs to be done. However, uh, we need to understand what the rules are first. Um, and so what, once we know what those are, uh, it'll be a little bit easier to talk in an educated manner. Uh, Nick, what are your thoughts? I completely agree, Nate. Yeah, you bring up a couple of great points. From a manufacturer's perspective, what we've seen is that missing guidance that you referred to with the, the actual implementation of the Inflation Reduction Act and all the various incentives is kind of the key barrier that we're facing. But we're taking active steps to reach out to contractors, distributors, customers, everyone in the whole downstream supply chain and ringing the bell saying, hey, there's a lot of money available. We want to make sure that you can take advantage of that. And part of it is doing the legwork now and getting out you know, previous communications about what it looks like to take advantage of incentives. How can you bundle them with existing state programs? But also once that guidance comes out, maybe IRS or Treasury puts out a piece of information saying all of these products are now eligible, it's now getting that information out there, like you said, to contractors and making sure that at the end of the day, the consumer in their home is able to go into a meeting with their contractor and have all the information they need to know, they could save a lot of money by incorporating a heat pump, both from the energy perspective and also from these new incentives. Sounds good. So Weston, earlier you were talking about fuel switching as an option for utility energy efficiency programs. Um, but won't we also need a policy driver like a clean heat standard or um, some new fossil equipment bans to drive heat pumps uh, switch more quickly? Uh, yeah, like a clean heat uh, standard is, is really, really important. I think we're seeing that in certain states. Colorado, I know, has adopted one. Um, other things, I think, in terms of bans, I think it's just a subject, a con, a important consideration that um, probably other uh, different jurisdictions will have to uh, uh, um, approach differently. I know here in DC, um, they've decided to phase out incentives for natural gas equipment, um, given that the district I know has a, a plan for 100% um, renewable energy in the coming years. Um, uh, but there are just some important cost impacts to consider. I think natural gas programs, particularly those that focus on weatherization, are still going to continue to be really important for uh, homes. Um, but there are uh, just things to consider in terms of impacts for low uh, 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 LMI customers. Um, so I think uh, you know utilities and states are, are looking at this. I think it's just a matter of. Um, you know, looking at what's right for them and, and, and studying what the cost impacts are going to be for certain certain customers. Okay, 
Um, another question has come in um, as well. We say that heat pumps are 353% efficient. And somebody asks, how can you be more than 100% efficient? Isn't that, isn't that the top? Can you guys explain that? Nick, do you want to hit refrigeration cycle or you want me to do it? <laughs> Either way, we can both do it. You start. <laughs> All right, I'll take a swing. So uh, um, this is the magic of moving heat not making heat. So when you make heat, you have to use all the energy put towards creating the heat. So, you know, it, fire is making heat. You're, you're combusting something and you are creating heat. So all fossil fuel equipment is making heat. Um, resistance electric, if you're used to, I mean, the easiest thing to think of is a toaster where the elements get red. Um, like in a heat pump only system, they have resistance backup and we routinely call that the toaster. There's like 15 different names for that piece of equipment. So none of us know what the other one's talking about, um, <laughs> the regional names and, you know, pet names and everything. Uh, but, uh, that's all making heat. What the refrigeration cycle allows us to do, which is it, it's fundamentally changing things from a, a, a liquid to a gas and back. And then you compress it and you move things around. But what you're doing, that's a little too technical. You're taking heat from one place and you're moving it to another. And it seems strange to take heat out of cold air um, and pump it into a place that's warmer. But if you think about it, that's what your refrigerator is doing right now. So your fridge is 40 something degrees or high 30s. Your freezer is probably about zero, but there's heat coming out of the back of your fridge. It's removing the heat from that cold air. So a heat pump can do the same thing. And when you move heat, it's generally somewhere between 200 and 500% efficient. Um, it varies on a lot of uh, factors. So like at warmer temperatures, there's more heat that can be more easily removed. So your efficiency is higher at higher temperatures. That's actually why we chose a 41 degree uh, temperature for 3H. Um, because that that keeps your COP high, typically above that 300%. Uh, but also the odds of even a very leaky home needing more than what the heat pump is capable of putting out at a 40 degree temperature are pretty low. So we shouldn't get a lot of complaints from either contractors or homeowners, but we're still getting people used to the technology. But uh, that's that's one swing at it. So Nick, how, how do you explain um, the magic? That is the magic. Like you said, the Vega group Vapor compression cycle is a huge component of moving that heat. The heat transfers into the, the working fluid, which is the refrigerant, um, and then you're able to spread that throughout the home. And one of the reasons why we've seen it increase over time, I mean, especially in, in the new advantages like the inverter technology and some of the, the colder climate focus we've seen is due to the modulation of the speed at which we're able to transfer that heat and then displays it throughout the home. And that's due to variable speed fans. Um, and these new technologies are helping us to increase that coefficient of performance, which you may have heard, which is where we get that two to 500% um, efficiency, which sounds crazy, um, but it is truly happening. And it's, it's pretty magic, like you said, Nate. Yeah, great question. All right. So I wanted to switch to talking about duct work. Um, about a part of my home dates from 1940. So the duct work there is a bewildering mess. But I wanted to ask, do you recommend sealing and insulating any easily accessible ducts in unconditioned space when you're installing a hybrid heat pump? And is this something that HVAC contractors are comfortable doing? Or is it really not worth the extra effort? So in all things building science, there is one safe answer. It depends. And that is the answer here. So um, there's two primary pieces. Um, one is, are the ducts outside the envelope of the house where you heat and cool it? So if you live in the South and you have ductwork in the attic um, or you have an unconditioned crawl space, um, you know, dirt crawl space or something like that, and your ductwork is down there, sealing that really, really matters because it's like a triple whammy. Um, you're heating or cooling air and then you're ejecting it outside the house. Um, that same amount of air has to get sucked in from somewhere else, from outdoors, that's, that's uh, you know, hot or cold. Uh, so you're doing all kinds of weird things. There's air quality ramifications. There's lots of problems there. So if ductwork is outside the envelope, in general, yes, you want to seal it. But um, you may have a system that's trying to move more air 
So the, the actual air handler, the fan, is trying to move more air than what the ductwork is capable of. So if you seal ductwork and the ductwork already can't move enough air, you increase the pressure inside, which increases your energy use and also makes it fairly likely that that fan will fail near term. Um, so in general, it's, it, it's measured in inches of water column. Most uh, units are rated for a half an inch of water column. Um, I've seen metrics on this that are pretty solid. 70% of systems are above that half an inch and nearly 50% are above the 0.7 inch uh, metric, which is considered a risk of early failure. So um, it, like everything in building science, should I do this? Should I do that? Like we have to look at your individual home, your individual system, what we're gonna change that system to if we're changing the system um, and then decide which path we're going to do. Uh, so like HVAC 2.0, not to, to to plug it, but the, the comfort consult that's part of it comes to a home and measures the house for air leakage. How much uh, does the house leak, which is a huge piece in determining what the heat load is, what size equipment you need, how much does it take to heat it? So what, what piece of equipment do we need to use? Um, can we easily reduce what it takes to heat that home? Um, uh, are there any rooms that are substantially leakier than others? Because if you have one that's super leaky, it might need twice as much airflow um, to get the heating and cooling there to keep that space comfortable. And most homes don't have double the ductwork to one room than they do another. Uh, so you need to understand all of these pieces of the puzzle to really be able to answer a question like that. So it sounds like a simple question, um, but it's it's kind of like, well, I went to the doctor and like, I've got this cough and it's like, well, it could be a cold or you could be dying tomorrow. And until we run some tests, we really don't know. And the odds are it's a cold. My first class in law school, the contracts professor said, the answer to every question is it depends. So I guess it's... <laughs> It's it's beyond law and into many other areas. So what is the impact of weather on the savings between heat pumps and, say, propane heat? I can maybe start to take this by knowing Nate, you had answered it in chat. Um, but <laughs> to borrow the term that was just said, I think this also depends. Um, the, the weather equation uh, affects kind of the changeover point between when your heat pump kicks on and off and your backup heat then goes into effect. If you have propane, um, as you're probably well aware, if you have propane, it's a little bit more expensive than natural gas. So that um, if you have a location where maybe you're needing to kick on that propane heat more regularly, it can potentially increase the costs. Um, but also the heat pump itself is able to displace a lot of the heating need from the propane heat in the first place. So I don't, I can't necessarily give a concrete answer. Um, maybe Nate, you can, <laughs> but roughly the, the efficiency of the heat pump, the cold climate readiness of the heat pump, the more that those are efficient for the region that you're located in, the better the cost savings are going to be. Um, if you have a pretty moderate tempered climate, um, heat pumps are very, very good at displacing that propane heat and saving you a lot of money. So I'll, I'll stop with that because there's a lot of moving parts that go into it, but there's potentially significant savings. If I may jump in here, I'll just plug the our, our latest research report with RAP. I just put the the link in the chat, and and just really briefly, you know, if I may, I'll just I'll just share the screen of um, some heat pump efficiency curves, you know, showing that 200, 300 percent efficiency, right? So this is where what you can expect with a non-cold climate DOE baseline heat pump versus cold climate. So so just follow, you know, see the temperature you want. You know, let's say we're with a non-cold climate at 25. We're going to be about 200% efficient, right? A propane furnace is not going to be more than 100% efficient, right? So, so we're already doing two times better here with a heat pump than a furnace. And now looking at that ratio of propane to electricity prices, you know, in most cases, they're between one and two, right? So, so pretty much you know, until you really get down to, to, you know, these kinds of temperatures, you're, you're going to come up better with a, with a heat pump. And, and one of the things that we, you know, we, we really found in our research is that there's a whole lot of days in the year where the temperatures are up here, right? That, that there aren't, you know, of course, these days are cold and, and use a lot of heat, 
but just in terms of the, the total load, and, and of course, it depends where you are, but just don't discount the shoulder seasons and, and what your heat pump can do for you. You may, you may still experience some peaks and higher costs at the coldest days, but, but the shoulder seasons do, uh, do tend to pull ahead, in, and again, in most, most of the states. So Matt, I'd like to drill down on that a little bit more. Um, I'm in central Wisconsin, zone four. Um, so it's uh, fairly northern here. So do you recommend, as we're talking about hybrid heat, um, do you recommend regular heat pump, a cold climate heat pump? What's, what are you recommending here? Or does that make it a little more complicated to do a cold climate heat pump? And I'd also like you to drill down a little bit more on that. You said it's one to two. What does that mean? Uh, yeah, it makes me it makes it, it means I, I wish I'd uh, I'd added a decimal point to that to that table. So I, I apologize for that. Um, but yeah, I think in in central Wisconsin, um, you know, we can we can take a look at at um, you know some of the tables in the in the back of the report. But I I think that. The short answer is a little bit, you know, do you do you want to pay more upfront in in capital costs, you know, for a higher capacity cold climate heat pump, and so you'll be able to get lower costs at those lower temperatures, or do you spend less upfront, get a get a standard heat pump or just just lower performance, and then you end up kind of trading that off for higher Operating costs at those lower temperatures, or or again, or you, you you try to kind of play both fuels off each other and and see what's cheapest at, at a given temperature is 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 kind of where you know I, I, yeah I don't want to say it, it depends, but but you know I I think it 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 does kind of you know maybe going back to what the point Nate said this kind of gives you some choice right and maybe that choice is a little overwhelming, but again you can kind of trade these things off as a customer, uh, see what the situation is in your region, which fuels are more expensive and. And, and hopefully with the help of, of your contractor, come up with a strategy that, that makes sense for you. So Camille, I'd like to take a swing at this. Um, uh, so first, just a technical comment. Um, an air conditioner in your climate probably isn't gonna run much more than three or four months a year. Um, Cause the summers aren't crazy long there. Um, and I'm from Cleveland, so similar, just slightly warmer. Um, uh, a heat pump is going to run somewhere between 10 and 12 months per year. Because uh, like it, it, even if you have a very cold design day where it's 10 below or something like that, the odds are at some point in that week, it's going to be up into the teens or the 20s. Um, and at, at that point, the, the a heat pump can shoulder the load if it's a cold climate. Now, the main reason in our experience um, uh, it, to consider the better heat pumps is comfort. So there's a really critical piece here. So uh, like the, the, the easiest way that I've found to explain it is imagine that you want to get clean and you have a choice between a 10 gallon bucket dumped over your head all at once or a five minute shower. Um, it's both 10 gallons of hot water. So it's the same amount of energy that's going to get used. Uh, but if you have an oversized piece of equipment, particularly when say it's 50 degrees outside or something like that, or 45, where it's, it's fairly mild, um, uh, a furnace is probably 10 times larger than it needs to be at that point. So it's like having that bucket dumped over your head, uh, where if you have a heat pump, uh, particularly when, when you move into the cold climate, they're all inverter, which means variable speed. Uh, so now you have a, a gas pedal where you have a range of speeds that that can run at, um, you know, three minimum and like 750 is the most that I've seen, where your furnace is on or off for the most part, like 80% of equipment single stage. So if you bump up, now that heat pump, it first has lower capacity than the furnace, and then uh, it can drop down to say 25% of that full capacity. So it's trickling that heat or cool into your home as the house needs it, because how much heating and cooling a house needs varies second by second, day by day. It's never exactly the same. So if you move to a cold climate piece of equipment, it's going to be capable of doing all that. And you're going to notice rooms in your house are going to be much more even in temperature. Um, and so to me, my, my joke is friends don't let friends buy single stage. 
So I can't stand single stage equipment. I despise it. It's 80 or 85% of the equipment out there. Um, I have yet to sell anything single stage personally. Um, and our guys move from 5% uh, uh, single or 5% variable speed to 95%. Uh, variable speed in general when they're using our program. So the the answer to this, like, will there be cost savings? Maybe. Uh, I don't know. What are the fuel prices? What's the load of your house? What's your climate? Um, uh, what what's the, the what are the fuel prices doing? Things are going crazy right now. Like I can't predict what's going to happen, but I can predict that your house is very likely to be substantially more comfortable if you choose a nice piece of equipment that's inverter and variable speed. Does that help? It does. Thanks. And it's a great discussion here. So how risky is it to people to switch out to um, switch their air conditioner to a heat pump? Um, is this something that is like kind of like a, eh, it's a, it's a lower risk proposition because it's not much of a lift or is it something that you should really like really consider um, um, all the ins and outs and really do some of all of those variable calculations that you're talking about the the biggest risk to me is early failure of the fan motor um and the it, we're moving from an old school think of it like a linebacker uh fan motor it's called psc and you can do anything to them and they just don't care they keep running um so it's like a 300 pound football player you know you throw another 300 pound football player on his back and he just keeps going he might slow down but he ain't stopping um where the the newer motors that are being used now they're far more efficient they're ecms electronically uh commutating motor uh they are much more like a european soccer player where if you touch them on the shoulder they fall over writhing in pain um so they're not quite that sensitive but they're way more sensitive than what has been used in the past and so if you put them in a system where they're trying to move more air than the ductwork is capable of moving, there could be a problem. So it's a relatively simple thing. Uh, you check what's called static pressure, um, or we call it duct pressure. It's the pressure inside the ducts. So if you understand what that is, you can size the equipment to the ducts. Um, or if you make weatherization changes, what we usually find is most duct systems are undersized for the system that's there. But if you right size the system, you typically right size the ducts. Um, so again, these are things that you can test, but it's running a static pressure test is 10 or 15 minutes. Um, and there's some really nice tools on the market for doing that. So again, this is part of our process. Even in a free quote, we offer people um, a, a duct pressure test, as we call it, or static pressure. But that's the biggest risk is the early fan failure. Other thoughts? Yeah, if I may jump in, um, I think, you know, in general, you know, the, these these risks that Nate mentions, I think they're somewhat alleviated, again, by by using, doing this hybrid approach, right? Because you you will always still have that furnace or boiler uh, to fall back on, right? In case, in case there's a problem with the heat pump, in case there is any dissatisfaction. So I think maybe that's one more benefit of this approach that we hadn't touched on is that you know, I think people worry about uh, losing their furnace or having being dissatisfied with the heat pump, right? And through this hybrid approach, that is one more barrier that just doesn't exist. And people can get comfortable, installers can get comfortable uh, with, with heat pumps through this approach. Yeah, and I just add like, like hopefully as, as more of these installs are done um, and more success stories come out to learn about, um you know, just how comfortable people are with these um i mean just looking at some of the colder climates um i think i mentioned efficiency mean before like mean a notoriously very cold climate um and they've been installing you know 20 uh, last year 27,000 heat pumps um and they've been doing um studies just to show um uh to look at how satisfied customers are with those those installs and um i a study they did last year looked at you know and found that like seven of the ten home ten homes of that installed uh, heat pumps with backup didn't even need to really turn on the backup heat um, during that winter. Um, looking from February to June, so um, I mean if, if if it's working in Maine in some of these cold climates, um, I think uh, it's people should be um, uh, pretty comfortable. All right, everyone. Sorry. 
Oh, go ahead, Nick, please go ahead. I'll maybe raise one final point that Matt brought up uh, a couple of days ago that I thought was an excellent point. And that is in terms of risk, even if there's a nightmare scenario, you hate the heat pump, you don't want to run it anymore and everything impossibly in the world has gone wrong, you could go to your thermostat, turn the heat pump off, and you are in a no worse spot than you were the day before you installed it. Plus, you got an $8,000 check from the government, and you got a $2,000 tax rebate. So you saved money, and nothing has changed. So no matter what, in terms of the actual comfort for you, in terms of what products you're able to install in your home, uh, this is one of those scenarios where it seems like a win-win, and there's a very, very, very low risk besides, like Nate mentioned, that minor um, duct and static issue. All right, we like win-win situations. All right, everyone, I want to note that we are going to technically end the webinar here at the 60 minute mark, but we plan to continue the question and answers um, questions because we have a lot of questions that you guys have submitted that we have not yet answered. But for those of you who are going to leave at this point, um, I want to say that, you know, this is a great, uh, this hybrid heat approach is helpful because it doesn't replace it displaces less efficient cooling which also gets your heating especially during the uh, the shoulder months we do recommend if you have more questions in our table to stay that you look at the paper that wrap and clasp have produced um, and that we referenced during this webinar and i'd like to thank all of the presenters for their time and expertise and really great discussion here today so i want to thank everybody who has joined us and note that we are going to um, continue our discussion with a few more questions. Camille, there's a good question in here that I'd like to tackle if I may. Um, it's from Stephanie Cruz. Uh, can you talk a bit about the difference in user experience with a heat pump? For example, the heat pump running longer and more often versus the traditional furnace that fires on high and then shuts off. It seems like user education is a big part to ensure success in heat pump implementation. Um, and yes, that's a, that's a wonderful question and comment. Uh, so the, the way that I oftentimes explain uh, running a heat pump is if you've ever tried to pass a truck with an underpowered car, you really have to think ahead. Um, so furnaces have an outrageous amount of power compared to what is needed. They are a blunt instrument. Uh, so it's like a 500 horsepower Corvette that has an on off switch. Um, uh, you wouldn't want to ride with a guy with a 500 horsepower car that has an on off. It's either flat out or nothing. And that's what a furnace is. So um, if you only have 50 or 80 horsepower, um, you need to plan ahead when you're moving things. So instead of doing big setbacks, don't set it from like 70 to 60. Don't do that. Um, because when you turn it up, particularly if you have a heat pump only system, it will kick into the resistance and uh, it will use that to, to bring it back up primarily. Uh, so in general, what we recommend is no more than a two degree setback at night. Um, preferably find a temperature that you are comfortable with um, all the time and forget that the thermostat exists. That's the ideal with heat pumps. Just let them run um, because they're going to run almost all the time, particularly these variable speed ones. So yeah, it takes some education. And sometimes I have to give my clients a hard time or make fun of them. Um, that can be a useful tool at times if you have a good relationship with them. Uh, but yeah, it takes some consumer education. But in general, let's just think of uh, doing a passing maneuver with a slow car. Um, what, what's the difference there? And that's that's usually what it looks like. All right, thanks for that. We have another question here. Uh, this is from somebody with an older home, a hundred plus year old home with hydronic heating system, hot water radiators. About six years ago and they installed a high velocity air conditioning system with small di because they have small diameter ducts. Uh, the compressor is on our roof. Air handling unit is in our attic. Any issues with replacing the air conditioner with a heat pump? No, that's that's not a terrible application at all. Um, the the issue is those are typically not variable speed fans, so it's important to understand um, when you're running variable speed heat pumps, it's both a variable speed outdoor unit and a variable speed fan that can uh, turn up and down together. So like a Unico, that's the most common brand of uh, high velocity. Um, those fans are on or they're off. 
So it's going to be a single stage heat pump. You could put uh, like Bosch makes a nice heat pump that has pretty good cold uh, climate performance. You could put a Bosch outdoor unit on that um, and probably have it work. Now, it's if it's that old, it's probably an R22 system. So you need to change indoor and outdoor to um, a, a modern refrigerant. But that's one option. Um, and then oftentimes what we'll do, one of my clients, we removed his high velocity system and we installed um, uh, low velocity uh, ducted mini splits and we did three systems throughout his house. So there's other ways to go there. That was not an inexpensive thing. Um, so the cheap and easy way is change the outdoor unit um, if, if you can. Um, and then otherwise there's, there's more things to keep in mind. Plus, do you, do you want to insulate and air seal the house? So it takes less to, uh, to heat. So anyway, that's, it depends. Remember that answer? Um, that's the answer. So there's a lot of different paths there. And really you want to think about, um, what are your goals? What does the house need? Um, and then what is the budget? And when you understand those three things, the project typically coalesces and it makes it easy to make the decision. All right. Well, I wanted to ask a question getting to the it depends, right, as we're all in different regions of the country with different costs. Um, are there any calculators or other tools that are available for a homeowner to get a rough idea of the bill impacts from switching to a heat pump for their house? Oh, homeowner based, I don't know, Nick, do you have anything there? Yeah, there are a few um, that are available. Um, I know, I think the White House released a calculator in support of the Inflation Reduction Act. Um, I know there are a couple organizations that have released their own calculators. Um, so I could dig through and try to find those. I don't have them off the top of my head. Um, I know Johnson Controls, for example, has a calculator for um, some more of its commercial applications, for example. Um, but in addition to those calculators, I think the energy guide label is often a great starting point. Um, you can go to something called the AHRI directory, um, look up your model number, and click on its estimated energy cost for the year. You can get that label anywhere, you can compare it to what your furnace is. And that's a really quick and easy way to do an exact calculation between what you have now and what you're thinking about getting. Uh, but there are some sophisticated calculators out there and I'm sure we could round some of those up. All right, thanks. And we'll, we send out the email um, in a couple of days with the link to this webinar um, and the resources here. We can do some research and include that as well. Um, another question came in, um, as more utilities implement time of day rates, thermostat manufacturers should be looking at ASHP switchover based on time of day and OA. Almost all thermostats in the market today switch over is based on OA. Um, this person is only aware of BKR Energy doing the ASHP switchover based on time of day. Um, anybody else looking at this? And maybe can you guys explain a little bit more about what we're talking about when we have thermostats running on kind of an existing system that we're used to, any kind of thermostat considerations for switching over to a heat pump in this manner? Hey, do you want to start with this one or otherwise I can try to tackle it? <laughs> hey, you go first. Okay, sounds good. Yeah, it's a great question. So um, it sounded like there was this idea around how the outdoor air OA has been kind of the primary driver of how thermostats change that change over temp. Um, and one of the trends that we've seen, and speaking from experience with Johnson Controls in the name, um, there's a shift towards making the thermostats uh, work better with the technology that you have. Um, this technology already exists, um, especially in, in the commercial space where there's huge economies of scale with setting very, very precise set points. Um, transferring that into the residential space is a, a huge area we're working on. Um, and uh, might also already provide options for that. And um, to, to the question, yes, um, we're, we're working on developing these thermostats that are down to second by second updates on when a set point should be switched, looking at fuel costs and looking at when it might be beneficial to switch over to gas, for example. Um, so even though the technology might not be perfectly set up with the old thermostats that are maybe in the homes today, uh, the next generation of technology that's coming out is designed to tackle this exact problem and make sure that the homeowner is getting the most efficiently and comfortably cooled home at the lowest cost possible. Yep, I, I would agree. It's basically a software problem for all this. Um, so I'm, I'm not particularly concerned. Um, uh, Camille, there's, there's a question on gas infrastructure. Had you looked at that one yet? 
I had. And so we got, we're talking about hybrid heat here with having uh, heat pumps and then we're still maintaining backup um, heating as well. So what happens to the gas infrastructure, which is, you know, it's expensive and it's based on this existing system, but if through increased use of the heat pumps through hybrid heat and other switch over that occurs naturally, we're gonna be using less um, of the existing gas infrastructure what's going to be the impacts on this? And are we looking at only uh, supply side savings here? What are kind of your calculations regarding that? Well, uh, what, one thing I'd like to state here is the, the hybrid heat homes uh, idea, this whole thing is not a long-term solution. This is a near-term, mid-term, five to 10 year solution. Um, because uh, it, yeah, we're, we've probably heard about the death spiral of utilities. Um, electric utilities are gonna be fine. We can't live without them, particularly in Northern climates. We just can't. Um, gas utilities are facing a death spiral um, because as more and more people disconnect their homes, there are fewer and fewer people to support the cost of the distribution set, uh, um, systems, which means the meter fees are going to need to go up. So in Cleveland, I've noticed they've gone from $15 a month to $40 a month in the past decade. Um, that's a pretty big move at $40 a month. Um, that costs $500 a year just to have the meter. And in general, we're finding that the operating costs uh, increase from using a heat pump versus a furnace are almost always below $500. So that's part of how we have sold full electrification to our clients is, well, you're already due for the water heater. We're doing the HVAC. If you're game for doing your dryer and your stove, we'll remove the meter and you're going to be operation cost neutral versus where you are today, even with very cheap frac gas. So yeah, we're, that it, it, this is going to, in a lot of ways, accelerate the death spiral. Um, and, you know, that, that just is. Um, and so we want to make sure that the, the, like the workers and whatnot are, are well protected, but otherwise there's things that change. Um, I mean, we don't have buggies anymore. Like horses and buggies are quaint. Um, they are not what we use as transportation. We're looking at, so I call this the last fuel switch because I don't know that we're ever going to change from electricity. We used to heat with wood and then uh, we, we heated with coal and then oil and then gas and now electricity. This should be the last fuel switch. Um, but yeah, this is going to affect things. Um, and so I'm curious what the other perspectives are too. And I'd like to hear from the others as well. Um, I noted that we spoke earlier a little bit about the clean heat standard. Um, and in some states, clean heat standard is, um, is really engaging uh, utilities across the spectrum and fuel distributors um, of all sorts as well in installing heat pumps and uh, switching out business models as well so that there's ways to um, incorporate the utility model in this switch to clean heat standard looking at it that way as well um, and can provide a glide path um, which is useful for utilities and fossil fuel distributors uh, and the opportunity to diversify operations um, other panelists any thoughts on this as well yeah it's, uh, i'd say like yeah there's certainly opportunities with clean heat standards um so opportunities for decarbonized fuels. Um, you know, we've done some some sort of forward-looking analyses, looking out to like 2030, about looking at what the most cost-effective um, you know configurations in terms of heat pumps are going to be. Uh, looking at like a decarbonized scenario where the the grid is more decarbonized um, and uh, and uh, there's more switch over to renewable decarbonized fuels and we still found that you know heat pumps are going to be most cost cost effective probably for 80 percent of the country anything lower than you know Detroit basically in terms of uh, climate you know above that it's going to be more cost effective really to have probably a, a backup um I would say like also the, the, one of the more important considerations that we're kind of thinking of is just in terms of equity and, and low-income customers like the folks that do not have you know, don't have the resources necessarily to electrify at the same rate as others, um, what sort of protections are going to be in place 
for for those. And I think just you know looking at ways to um, uh, prioritize those customers and, and make sure they're included in the clean energy transition and 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 in electrifying everything is going to be really important. Um, you know, opportunities to incorporate electrification into you know the federal WAP program. Um, there's a number of states like you know California, New York that are really going after uh, multifamily buildings and and trying to find opportunities to electrify those homes. Um, uh, offering higher incentives for uh, you know homes that with tenant paid meters and just looking for opportunities to zero in on on those sorts of customers and 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 get um, incentives towards them um, having. Um, you know, protections in place for those low income customers in terms of energy of affordability um, goals, making sure those customers aren't, you know, aren't being saddled with the costs of, um, you know, this, this phase out. Um, streamlining bill assistance, uh, but a whole range of uh, things that I think are just important to think about when we think about equity and, you know, with this. Curious if other, other folks have other, other thoughts as well. Yeah, thanks for that, Weston. And it'd be nice to um, also be able to provide participants with examples of other states that are doing those programs that recognize that this is, it's a, in order to have this equitable transition, we need to build the policy in upfront um, and really target incentives so that they're usable by all, um, by all participants as well. So I wanted to follow up with Matt on refrigerants. Um, in installers have proposed heat pumps with R410A. What is the proportion of US heat pump market with lower global warming potential refrigerants? For example, below 750 GWP. Is there a cost difference? I think the proportion has to be quite small since I think those refrigerants have are only now just being approved uh, by state building codes. Um, so I, I, I don't, you know, I don't want to speculate what what it is, but I think it's it's low, and these are kind of the leading products right now. Um, so I imagine they would they will also be more expensive. But but I'm sorry, I don't have those details. I can maybe talk to this a little bit. Um, yeah, it's it's a great point, Matt. We don't know for sure yet. Um, with the, the transition um, to do efficiency standards on the, under the Department of Energy starting in 2023, uh, we anticipate kind of this product mix to go out there. And like you said, um, R410A is most likely going to be the, the substantial majority of refrigerant located inside of a heat pump across America. Um, however, once we get into 2024 and 2025, the implementation of the AIM Act will necessitate a step down in the um, average GWP across all industries, including the AC and heat pump industry. And that's where to the, I think the question asked, those under 750 GWP refrigerants will start to come in. In terms of actual cost impacts on equipment, it's projected to be minimal. I think there's a couple of studies out there that show refrigerants are a handful of percent of the, the cost of an actual equipment, one to two, maybe three. Um, and with the change in supply of our 410A, uh, we also anticipate these new refrigerants that are lower GWP to be cost competitive. So in terms of, of the mix, even though it is currently 410A and is projected to do that for the next one to two years, starting in 2025, especially when the, the EPA implementation of the AMAC really kicks off, um, I anticipate a very large transition to these new lower GWP refrigerants. All right, thanks for that. Um, we had a question on uh, efficiency Maine and efficiency Vermont. And note that um, they both report to their regulators that on average, the heat pumps in their program reduce fossil fuel usage between 25% and 33%. But Weston, you referenced a 10 customer study that seemed to be different. Can you explain the difference? I don't have all the all the details on that. I can I can dig up the uh, efficiency main uh, report um, and uh, share that along. Uh, yeah, I saw that in the, in the chat here. Um, folks were looking for a link to that, so um, yeah, I can dig that up and <laughs> send it along for folks. Well, I could take a swing at that because I I suspect that that's primarily a uh, uh, operations and climate thing. Uh, Maine's very cold. So uh, people probably aren't running the heat pump as hard, and particularly if they are manually switching over, because those are primarily ductless mini splits there. 
um, versus the uh, the boiler on their house. So that's probably part uh, part going to be it's a cold climate and part going to be the the clients are doing their own changeovers. So that would be my bet. Um, actually, I should make one last point too. So in watching houses that we've done hybrid systems in, we have reduced natural gas usage in Cleveland by as much as 90%. So when you think of what's the reduction of uh, fossil fuels from a heat pump, uh, I'd say 25% would be on the low side and 100 can also happen. So a good friend of mine in North Carolina put a hybrid in his house. Uh, he's an HVAC contractor. And the only time that his furnace has run in the past decade was when he started it up after he installed the system. It's never run since. So that's 100% reduction. Um, and that's uh, North Carolina. So the climate zone four. So I wanted to ask a little bit further what you've just started to talk here about, Nate. We've talked about the cost reduction. We've talked about emissions reductions. We've talked about a lot of the technical components in the switching from air conditioners to heat pumps. What has been the customer experience with hybrid heat? Can you give a few more stories beyond the North Carolina one? What's the experience? Um, so th there's an it depends here. One of the curses of single stage uh, heat pumps is they tend to have the airflow turned up quite a bit. So the air when the heat pump is running is oftentimes coming out of the vents between 85 and 100 degrees, which can feel cold. Um, so you can turn down the airflow on the, the air handler, the fan um, of the furnace and increase that temperature some, but also the inverter heat pumps are generally putting higher output temperatures out. So I have a Bosch heat pump on my own personal home and uh, it's routinely putting out 110 degree air. So it feels like a furnace running. So that is a nice experience, but you need to move into the, the inverter units. Um, and typically the better air handler. So you're, you're generally looking at higher end systems. Uh, but like from the IRA, we'll see what the CEE rules end up coming out as. Uh, but it's going to, at a minimum, require 16 SEER equipment, which is mid to upper end. And you're fairly likely to get into that type of equipment uh, with that program. So if that's the case, that should be a, a good thing. But the experience can be very good if you are managing a few things. And the main thing is the output temperature uh, from the, uh, the vents that people notice. All right, well, thank you. We are nearing the end of our 30 minute segment, ex, uh, extra part of the webinar here. And I wanted to close out with about a minute each from each of you on closing observations as we talk about hybrid heat to see, hear what you are thinking. I can maybe kick it off. Um, from a manufacturer's perspective, we're, we're very excited to get heat pumps in as many buildings as possible. As we kind of spoke about throughout the presentation, um, this, this hybrid model is a great opportunity to really make a no-brainer decision. If an AC unit needs to get replaced, replacing with a heat pump gives you a low cost, high efficiency, um, high greenhouse gas mitigation potential um, that, like Nate mentioned, can provide even more substantial comfort improvements. Um, and really enhances the, the customer experience while meeting all of these different check marks that we're looking for in terms of sustainable growth. So heat pumps, we're very excited about and we're excited to see what happens next. Um, yeah, if I may go next, uh, I think uh, two things. One, you know, by, by installing a heat pump when an air conditioner fails, you kind of remove some of that emergency uh, replacement anxiety that might happen if your if your heating system fails in the winter, you know you have, now you have two heating systems, so that gives you uh, some more resilience. Um, so I think that those are points we we didn't really touch on, but but I think it's, it's also worth considering. Um, you know, again, you, you can make a better decision when that furnace fails. Um, the other thing I wanted to point out is, um, you know, Clasp does a lot of international work, and talking to some of our colleagues in China, I was struck at. Uh, some of the official data that, that pointed to high penetration of heat pumps. There was, you know, about 100 million uh, households uh, per, per a government survey were already heating with heat pumps in China. And I was like, oh, wow, how, how can they be so far ahead, right? And, and my Chinese colleagues pointed out, no, those are just air conditioners. And, and sure enough, pretty much all air conditioners in China are already 
two-way reversible. They provide heat. That's the main source of heat in um, you know basically uh, areas south of Shanghai, the kind of the warm, uh, the warmer parts of China. And that's also the case in Japan. All, all air conditioners are reversible in South Africa as well, right? So there, there are entire countries that already do this. Uh, they, they just, you know, it's a no-brainer to, to have your air conditioner, have, a, have your car have the reversing gear. Um, so that would be my, my summary point. Well, I, I'll go next. So there's a common thing that's said in the sales world, which is good, fast, or cheap, pick two. Um, and this is converting air conditioners to heat pumps is one of the very, very few unicorn ideas where you can actually get all three. So it's good, fast, and cheap. Um, so that's an important thing to, to note. Um, and also like this is, it, 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 I'm obviously a very large electrification advocate and have been for many years, well before it was cool. And uh, this is a hyper pragmatic idea. So is this perfect? Is this full electrification? No, but this is something we can do today at scale for very low cost. Uh, and I guess I just close. I, I'm kind of like the energy efficiency policy guy here. So I think we're kind of um, just very excited. I think this past year, um, last year and a half to have seen a lot of really promising legislation out of some key states. I, um, you know, we look, look at the Northeast a lot for <clears throat> examples of really some best practice programs, but um, with what's happened in Minnesota and Illinois, I think Maryland now too, with their Climate Solutions uh, Policy Act, um, there's going to be a, several states really uh, investing quite a bit more in this and um, to in specifically to try to achieve their, their new uh, emissions reduction goals statewide. Um, it's been a great year. Uh, the Inflation Reduction Act, which really could report, provide a whole ton of resources to states to help push the uh, move the needle on this more as well. Um, so that's been great. Um, but yeah, I think overall, uh, from what we've, we've seen, we're, we're hoping to see a lot more great stories out of some states that we haven't seen in the past. So, um, uh, so yeah, lots of opportunities out there, and so looks promising. All right. Well, thank you so much, gentlemen, for such a, a great discussion on a lot of different uh, aspects of this uh, exciting topic here. And, you know, Weston, as you noted, we have rising gas prices, we have different uh, federal and state legislation that's going to be changing this from a policy perspective across the U.S. And so it's really highlighting that right now the time is ripe to accelerate, to accelerate and celebrate the deployment of heat pumps across the uh, country. So hybrid heating is going after less efficient air conditioners, and it's a promising way to boast, boost home heating conditioners that look alike, but they provide two-way heat pump units that can provide highly efficient heating in addition to cooling at little extra upfront costs. So gentlemen, thank you so much for this great conversation from all these different perspectives. Um, participants, we will be sharing a link uh, to this webinar with all the materials that we have spoken about here, as well as some follow up to some of these questions. And we look forward to discussing with everybody again in the future. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.